Hey everyone, I just played Crow Country, a game that in a lot of ways felt as though it was made specifically for me. I'm a sucker for theme park gone wrong stories and I'm always on the lookout for the next retro survival horror game able to take me back to the genre's heyday from the 1990s. So to say I was a little excited when I saw Crow Country offered both is somewhat of an understatement. Crow Country was developed by SFB Games and tells the story of special agent Mara Forrest, a woman searching for Edward Crow, the owner of the titular theme park who has gone missing within its walls. The park has been abandoned for years, but that doesn't mean it's empty. Monstrous guests still wander the attractions, guarding the park's strange secrets. Having now played Crow Country back to front four times, I'd be lying if I said it was the game I wanted it to be, but that doesn't mean I walked away unsatisfied. There's a lot I love about Crow Country, but also a couple of things I really don't like too, so let's talk about it. But but before I get my hands into the guts of this game, there are going to be mild visual and mechanical spoilers throughout the video, even outside of the sections on story, so consider this your only warning. Anyway, let's get to it. The scares begin before you even reach the main menu, at least on PC, since Crow Country doesn't currently support playing with a mouse and keyboard. This roller coaster rides controller only, though I do believe the developers are working on official keyboard and mouse support. It's not a huge issue, certainly not one so bad I'd refund the game over it like I've seen some people do, but it does kind of tie into my biggest criticism with it. Crow Country is unique in that it's the only survival horror game I've ever played to offer me an experience I've only ever seen others go through. It gave me motion sickness. And I don't even really know why. When you think of survival horror games turning players around to the point of nausea, you picture fixed camera angles and tank controls, but no, Crow Country doesn't feature either. Something about having full control of the top-down camera and character movement independent from it just short-circuited my brain in a way that no other game has. It's not sluggish or unresponsive, it doesn't get caught on walls or lose focus on Mara, there's nothing mechanically wrong with the camera. It just makes me want to hurl my guts out. The worst of it had to be when aiming. Each time you hold down the button to aim, the camera snaps back around behind Mara so that you're both aiming directly in front of her, which isn't a bad design decision in and of itself, but man did it take some getting used to. What's weird is that it didn't last. I played the game for an hour when I first bought it, felt sick, didn't touch it for two weeks weeks, and when I finally came back to it my brain was perfectly fine with the camera controls. I know. I'm just as confused as you. But having thought about Crow Country for the sake of writing this script, I think I've come to understand why I bounced so hard off it that first session. I went into the game with certain expectations. Crow Country doesn't describe itself as retro survival horror, but it certainly looks the part. And even the first words on its store page are, quote, the year is 1990, end quote. To me, that brought to mind certain control schemes, certain camera mechanics, certain combat rhythms, that just aren't present. I didn't realise you could manipulate the camera, I wasn't prepared for the way it moved while aiming, and I certainly wasn't ready for the fact you could move Mara and the camera at the same time. Which, I want to make clear, is entirely on me. None of that is Crow Country's fault. I do find it amusing though that so many people bounce off classic survival horror games due to their clunky controls and restrictive camera angles while I was turned off Crow Country because it wasn't clunky enough. Crow Country might have a retro aesthetic, but mechanically it's modern to the bone. All of which is to say, once I started playing it like a top-down shooter instead of a survival horror game, once I started using both thumbsticks rather than the D-pad for character movement and the right analogue stick for camera control, I had a much better time. This sort of thing is subjective of course, but I think trying to play Crow Country with a mouse would just bring that motion sickness rushing back. I completely understand why the developers prioritize controller support over mouse and keyboard on PC. Anyway, now that we've solved that mystery and I've leaped that hurdle, I still think the camera controls kind of suck. Sorry. <laughs>
They may not make my stomach churn anymore, but that sudden snap when aiming is still so jarring. And once you are holding down the aim button, you can't actually move Mara or the camera anymore. All you can move is the aiming reticule, which is odd because outside of aiming there is a button that allows you to move backwards at a slow pace, which would have been much more appreciated in combat than out of it. The three quarters top down perspective makes precision aiming difficult, especially when things get in close to Mara. Especially if you're in a small cluttered room, even if you find the laser sights for every weapon. Some of that comes down to enemies being spindly or small, many twist and contort in weird ways as they approach to make aiming even harder, and Mara has a little weapon sway on top of that, which is not what I'm criticising, all of that is fine. It's just the perspective of the combat that I dislike. The three quarters top down view combined with the way the camera zooms around when you first hit the aim button fucks with my sense of direction. Simple as that. I remember having a similar problem with Signalis, another recent survival horror game with a three quarters top down perspective, but it was never so severe as here in Crow Country because the camera was always fixed in place. As such, I found the combat in Crow Country to be pretty unsatisfying, which is a shame because it does have a lot of depth. I've already mentioned how some enemies bend and twist as they approach to throw off your aim, which they do because precision and distance matter. When Weapons, weapons, weapons do more damage the closer an enemy is to the barrel when you pull the trigger, and all of them have weak points that you're encouraged to aim for. It's a balancing act, even more so than in other survival horror games, because Crow Country is covered in crates and bottles containing extra items, and traps that can deal damage to Mara, all of which can only be destroyed with gunfire. Do you play it safe and bring an enemy down with body shots at the expense of being able to disable newly spawned traps or open up some mystery boxes? Or do you risk it all on a headshot or an exploding barrel in the hopes you get lucky to give yourself more options later on? New enemies spawn in as the game goes on too, so you have to weigh up using the ammo to clean up a major thoroughfare now with letting it be overrun with monsters as you progress deeper into the story. It's a cool spin on survival horror resource management that was ruined for me because of my issues with the camera. Speaking of the weapons, I was also pretty disappointed disappointed by the basic roster. There are only four to find on a regular playthrough and three of them feel very similar to use. The only difference mechanically are how much damage they deal and how long they take to reload. Crow Country is also flush with explosive barrels and grenades that can be used for crowd control and add a few extra options to combat. Apropos of nothing, do not under any circumstances try to toggle the flashlight while aiming if you've got a grenade in your inventory. Oh dear. As for the traps, they're usually pretty easy to see. It's hard to miss a bear trap and a big green dome on the ground. The ones that always gave me grief were the rickety chandeliers and the poison spewing crow heads. There's something almost smug about the way they turn toward you when you get in close. Oh, how I hate them. After going through multiple Wily e. Coyote routines on my previous runs, neither the chandeliers nor the crow heads got me much on this recorded playthrough. But there is nothing more frustrating than to be dodging between enemies only to hear a slight hiss and discover you've been poisoned, or to be fleeing for your life from some sort of monster only to have a chandelier come crashing down through your skull. You do eventually get the hang of picking them out from the environment, not just these two trash lads but all the trap types, but it can be a steep learning curve. There are also one or two places where the camera actively hides them, like this poison trap at the entrance to Fairyland. It's worth getting rid of the ones in heavy traffic areas anyway, but you can also kill two birds with one stone if you can lure an enemy into the path of a trap. You don't even have to set them off yourself. I caught a couple of enemies wandering right into bear traps without any input from me, which is something to keep in mind if you're doing a pacifist run, because triggered traps also count as kills. Good luck! Overall, the only fight I found in any way mechanically engaging was the final boss. It's also the only enemy in the game to offer damage feedback, which is another issue I have with combat in general. Most enemies just don't react all that much to being shot. Maybe they jerk aside a little and make a noise, but damage doesn't make them slow or stumble in a way that says you're actually hurting them. You just shoot them a bunch and then they fall over. It's very clinical, I don't know how else to describe it. At least there's a good variety. 
Yeti. The camera controls and the combat are Crow Country's only mechanical stumbles though, at least in my opinion. The puzzles and the exploration were great. The theme park has a very natural design, with a lot of forward-facing attractions connected with staff-only corridors that led to a lot of fun, aha moments when seemingly separate areas suddenly clicked together on the map. I never encountered a puzzle that had the stink of developer moon logic to it. Everything was clearly communicated through notes, or environmental storytelling, or just common sense. None of the puzzles are particularly challenging or convoluted, but they are engaging, which is actually better, and make good use of the theme park setting, like the arcade and the shooting gallery in Ocean Kingdom, or the crypt in Haunted Hilltop. I was also impressed with how few repeats there were. The vast majority of the puzzles are unique. Very few of them even required that much backtracking between areas. Only a couple of late game puzzles and optional secrets demanded a lot of running around. My one and only criticism of the puzzles is that they might be too clearly telegraphed. Aside from hints offered by notes, you can find diagrams that just explicitly tell you what to do. And there are even fortune teller kiosks all over the park that can point you in the right direction. I love the look of them, I love the little crow head peeking out of the machine, but it's just one step too far for me in terms of player hand-holding, and I never used them. Not even to see what they did for this video. Even the most challenging puzzle in the game, figuring out the code from the slideshow in Spoilers, has its solution just written on the wall in the neighbouring save room, which is wild to me. I genuinely can't decide whether that's clever or condescending. On a similar note, I found myself swimming in supplies without even having to try that hard on normal difficulty. It's daunting at first to learn you need to use a bullet to open crates and containers, but you don't really need to. There's already so much ammo lying about on the ground if you take the time to look. Some of the items are well hidden like a grenade in the funnel of the train in this save room, but a lot of the time you don't even have to search that hard. Ammunition and healing items often stand out against the background anyway. If you're even slightly thorough, it's easy to end up with more than you can carry. And if you do actually find yourself low on supplies, you can always go dumpster diving for an extra medkit or box of ammo. It's all too much. Resource scarcity plays an important role in survival horror. You want to feel like you're on the back foot without being totally defenseless. But in Crow Country there was never a point where I felt even slightly concerned about the amount of ammunition or healing items I had. So, in a way, I'm glad I bounced off Crow Country when I first tried to play it because by the time I returned the developers had added in an extra extra higher difficulty. I completed Crow Country for the first time on Murder of Crows, and every single one of the balance issues I just mentioned were fixed. All of the extra puzzle hints were gone, the fortune teller kiosks were just destroyed, and there were far fewer items lying around. I actually had to think about whether to use ammunition on enemies or traps or containers in the hopes they might have extra items. You can't just find full boxes of ammo in the trash, you don't even get the option to check the bins until you're flat out of ammunition, and all you'll fish out anyway is a single extra bullet. The enemies hit harder, healing items are less effective, and overall it was much more of a survival horror experience than any of my subsequent playthroughs on the survival horror difficulty. So if that's what you're after, I would absolutely recommend the Murder of Crows difficulty. And if you'd rather avoid the combat side of things altogether, there's an exploration mode as well. I'm so glad I did play Crow Country on the hardest difficulty too, because it made finding each of the game's 15 secrets that much more of a triumph. On the normal difficulty you find extra weapons and special ammunition and upgrades and it's like whatever. But on Murder of Crows you need that shit. You can't survive without it. They're just as fun to figure out as the regular puzzles too. I really enjoyed them. For all my complaints about the camera controls, I am glad they're in the game though because they let you see more of the world, which is great. Crow Country has a retro visual style reminiscent of the original Final Fantasy VII more than any classic survival horror title, and it works really well to create a contrast between the over-the-top kid-friendly theme park environment and the unknowable horrors wandering its empty attractions. I've never been a huge fan of theme parks. There's something slightly nightmarish or uncanny valley 
badly about them, even when they're running as intended, that's always rubbed me the wrong way, and that same quality is what makes them such fantastic settings for horror stories. Crow Country makes the absolute most of it too. The park looks amazing. It consists of three separate themed areas with a fourth main hub down at the entrance, and all of them have their own vibe and their own colour palette without straying too far from the overall style of the park. Every area is covered with bins and vending machines, just like you'd see in a real amusement park. The hubs have signs pointing to nearby attractions and warnings about whether or not a ride is right for certain people. All the bright colours and detailed facades vanish the second you manage to find a way into the drab grey staff corridors that run between the rides. And that's all before you factor in that the place has been largely abandoned. It's easy to imagine Crow Country full of people having the time of their lives, which makes the fact it's deserted even more unsettling. Two years after closing down, the place hasn't exactly fallen into disrepair, but the streets are littered with garbage picked at by, what else, crows. And just about everything has a layer of grime or dust dulling the colours. The game's visual effects give it a crunchy old school look that makes it a little harder to pick out what exactly you're looking at too. Almost like you're staring at it through a layer of fog. The character models look good as well. Just like the park, they're able to convey a lot of personality through abstract shapes and colours without going overboard with details. Only Mara moves around all that much just by virtue of being the player character, but all their animations have a satisfying fluidity and dynamism that conveys vitality like the best of the PS1 era. Just look at that swagger. They pop off the screen like much of the theme park does, which, once again, serves to create a contrast with the enemies. The guests are all sickly reds and browns and greens, muted in tone rather than bright and bubbly. They jerk and twist and contort like they're in immense pain. Every step is a struggle for them, but that doesn't make them slow or weak. They obviously don't belong in a place like Crow Country. It's honestly a wonder that some of them can exist at all. If they actually reacted to getting shot, they'd be perfect. At least they sound good. The gloops and groans they make convey the pain they're in just as much as the animations, and a few of them come with their own unique music tracks too. The music really is the standout of Crow Country's sound design. Okoroi, the composer, did a fantastic job. The soundtrack is a mix of bubbly theme park jingles made to get stuck in your head, and creeping horror ambience meant to make your skin crawl. There are some great tracks in here. I was whistling the ticket kiosk theme all the way through writing this script. A lot of the puzzle and environmental sound effects are clean and crisp. They don't just sound good, they sound authentic to the kind of audio design you'd find in a theme park. And there will always be something charming about the bleeps and bloops of rare style dialogue. My one criticism when it comes to presentation is the weapons just lack weight. They don't roar when you pull the trigger, or even really bark, and when you combine that with the lack of reaction given by enemies when shot, the gunplay just comes off as a little flaccid.
I thought maybe that's because the weapons are working to the same cartoony style as the rest of the game, but whenever Crow Country presents moments of real danger or elements of real horror to the player, it's not treated like it's part of the theme park experience. The abstract shapes and bright colours melt away to reveal the rot underneath. It's treated a little more seriously, and I feel the game's weapons should have been handled the same way. Maybe not the starting handgun, but at least the other weapons, and certainly their upgraded variants. It didn't ruin the game for me, but when a mechanical swan leaves more of an impact sound-wise than the shotgun, then something has clearly gone wrong. It's a clash of tone that unfortunately extends into Crow Country's story as well. I've already mentioned how many of the puzzles are integrated into the park's attractions and rides, which is very charming. Puzzles in survival horror games often already come with idiosyncratic themes. An infamous example being the locks and keys in the Raccoon City Police Department corresponding to the four suits in a deck of cards, something even the recent remakes of Resident Evil 2 and 3 poked fun at. But when it's built into an amusement park attraction, there's no need to draw attention to it. The suspension of disbelief has already been established. So when Crow Country just runs with it, it's great. The puzzle in the crypt with its fake shotgun is a fantastic example of what I'm talking about. But there are also moments where the game does awkwardly bring up how idiosyncratic some of its puzzles are, how strange some of the park's layout is, and it just kills the vibe for me. Can I ask why the dig site is in that house? I thought the eggs were magnetic, but apparently not. Actually, the bottle is filled with acid, not alcohol. I shouldn't have to say this, but don't eat the poisonous mushrooms. Quote, Everywhere I go, doors are locked, paths are blocked. Always seems like I need some kind of weird key. It's infuriating. Oh yeah, it's that kind of place. You get the hang of it after a while. End quote. It's not so much the game cracking the odd self-conscious joke at its own expense that I don't like. It's that it happens so much, and it stands in such contrast contrast to the rest of the writing, which is otherwise excellent. Crow Country is hiding a lot of secrets that, like many of its puzzles, aren't exactly hard to figure out, but they are engaging. Like any good mystery box story, Crow Country strings out clues a little bit at a time, giving you the chance to try and piece the puzzle together before the big reveals. There's a great mix of theme park rules and regulations, staff memos regarding shady dealings and uninvited guests, strange numbers written in blood, and internal commentary from Mara herself that help build intrigue and atmosphere. But then every so often you'll be hit with, genre convention dictates this pizza box must contain ammo. Oh, it was only pizza, how silly of me. And just, guys, you didn't need this. And it's not like the game doesn't have good jokes either. Officer Harrison quickly correcting himself mid-sentence about running away from monsters was great. A lot of Mara's internal monologue brought a smile to my face. Especially one moment that brought to mind the classic My Son's Name is Also Bought bit from The Simpsons, from an episode that also incidentally took place in a theme park. In the same room with the pizza box, you find a captain's hat, and when you return later with an NPC to complete a puzzle, they'll be wearing it. It's a great little visual gag, which then becomes a moment of horror when you come back to the operator's room soon after, only to find the NPC replaced with a bloodstain. It's a fantastic shift in tone, but the resolution to the whole scenario is, in some ways, just as goofy as the pizza box moment. The game's tone is just all over the place. It almost feels like there were two writers fighting for control of the plot, one who wanted it to be a straight survival horror experience, the other who wanted it to be a horror comedy, and the end result is just a mess. Which is a shame, because there are some horror elements on offer here that are genuinely effective. Take your first encounter with an enemy. In most survival horror games, even today, there's a lot of build-up that leads to a big reveal. The music crescendos. The monster turns its head just like that 
that first zombie did in Resident Evil all those years ago. But not here. There's some build-up, sure. You can find a couple of blurry photos, the tension rises as you explore the park, but then you enter a staff corridor and the guests are just there. No big dramatic fanfare, no synthetic orchestral sting, just two enemies waiting for you in a dark hallway. It's an effective moment because of how understated and unexpected it is, but it's also one of the game's only good scares. Overall I didn't find Crow Country all that frightening. I'm a big horror buff, I'm desensitised to a lot of it, your mileage may vary. But its themes and reveals were absolutely disturbing. They gave me a lot to think about, which is why the game's occasional dip into outright silliness was so frustrating. I much preferred when the game leaned into B-movie camp, though I imagine where that line is drawn will be different for everyone who plays Crow Country. Beyond the tone swinging like a pendulum between silly and serious every other scene, my biggest criticism with Crow Country's story before getting into spoilers is that it has too many characters. This is a short game. My initial playthrough only took me five hours, and every subsequent run has only clocked in at three or less, but the story features nine characters, a number that gets bumped up to 11 or 12 depending on how you count the people who are already or about to be dead by the time you hit new game. Everyone is well designed and well written, but all the NPCs only get a couple of scenes before the climax, so you never really get to know them or do anything with them. Several of them just vanish for large portions of the runtime. You find Natalie Crow here outside her father's office early on, but I've never had her show up elsewhere until the late game when you finally get past the door. You stumble across Arthur at the very beginning of the game, but then he just spends the rest of the run waiting in Mara's car doing nothing. Harrison James the police officer feels present because he moves around the park as you progress through the story, but he doesn't really do anything other than jump from place place to place. The one exception is Julie the lawyer, who you can build quite a rapport with over the course of the game, and even recruit for a puzzle. I'd understand the large amount of characters if there were multiple branching story paths, but there really aren't. You are given a handful of choices across the game on whether to tell people certain things, or whether to help them or not, and you can technically change the ending, but not in any meaningful way. The story still reaches the same destination along much the same route, regardless regardless of your decisions. In fact, changing the ending felt more like the game accounting for me sequence breaking than actually playing it a different way. To have significantly different story paths, or even just more scenes with so many characters, would require a larger game, but even just cutting the cast down by one or two members would give the narrative a lot more room to breathe. It would be a shame to lose some of these characters because they all have interesting personalities and unique roles to play, but I really do think Crow Country would be better off if Harrison and Julie were combined, or Marv and Arthur were combined, or Natalie and Douglas were combined, if only to give everyone who survived the cull a little more screen time and stuff to do. I think it was a missed opportunity not to have more significant choices throughout the plot anyway, given Crow Country doesn't feature voice acting. It would be a lot easier to write different scenes and outcomes depending on player choice that way, but maybe that's asking too much. Much. Anyway, the story is fine as it is. It hits all the right beats in the right order, and tonal inconsistencies aside, it spins a good yarn. It's just overstuffed. It also feels like some stuff was left open-ended for potential DLC in the future. There's a section of the park called Cosmic Future that was never finished before Crow Country closed down, a passion project for the head of operations that never materialised due to a personal tragedy, and the whole thing just keeps coming back up despite not having much to do with the narrative. It could be it's just symbolic of certain things, and if so it's pretty clever, but I don't know, something about it just screams DLC to me. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Anyway, to talk about the rest of the story, I'm going to have to get into spoilers, so if you want to stay pure, go to here.
Mara's search for Edward Crow gets off to a rocky start, but if you've got a good eye, you might catch him watching her from the very first save room in the game. He keeps a close eye on her, and every so often he'll ring her up on a staff phone to try and explain, in his own stilted way, what led him down the path he's currently on. Along the way you'll discover what led to Crow Country closing its gates two years before the events of the game. A young girl called Elaine Marshall had a violent encounter with one of the monstrous guests, and ended up in hospital. The more you learn about Elaine's attack and Mara's intentions, it becomes clear that the two are one and the same long before the game spells it out for you. It's a reveal that Crow Country starts building to from its opening moments, sprinkling clues through dialogue with NPCs, and even Mara's own internal monologue whenever she breaks character. Just to the fact she's so much shorter than all the other NPCs stands out, and it's great to catch all the little hints on a second playthrough. Why would a special agent think about calling the police after finding a body? How would a stranger to the park know how to open this locked cell in an out of the way employee only area? My favourite has to be when she just drops the act while searching for a nameplate in the gift shop. But it does raise some questions, like why do some of the NPCs who clearly know who she is go along with the charade? Keeping up the act for Harrison, Marv, Arthur and Natalie makes sense, because they've never met, even if most of them obviously don't really believe her. But Tolman absolutely should know who she is, given how involved he was with Elaine's attack years earlier. And yet he goes along with Amara's disguise. Furthermore, Julie is a lawyer representing Elaine's family trying to get financial compensation out of Crow for the attack, and the two have a very familiar tone that suggests they know each other. But even if they haven't met before, we see the marshals provided Julie with photos photographs of Elaine, who is meant to be bedridden in hospital, so it strikes me as very strange that Julie never brings this up with Mara. Yes, Elaine dyed her hair before coming to the park and may have cut it too, but she's pretending to be a special agent when she's obviously a sick teenager out of her depth and I refuse to believe Julie, a woman whose job it is to be meticulous about details, wouldn't notice that, even in such a high stress environment. I wouldn't mind so much if Crow country's tone was all silly all the time. There's a lot of comedy gold to be mined out of such a paper thin disguise. But again, the game often treats its horror elements with deathly seriousness, and it feels as though the NPCs only preserve the reveal for the player's sake rather than their own. Maybe I'm missing something? I don't think Mara ever introduces herself to Julie, and I don't think the disguise is ever brought up in her presence, but like the tonal inconsistencies, it stands in in contrast to the rest of the writing, even if I still really like the twist and its method of reveal before the final boss. Much better in my opinion is the story behind the guests. Before the theme park was even built, Edward Crow discovered seven mysterious metal roots poking out of the ground in rural Georgia. The roots had an outer layer of copper, but their cores are solid 24 karat gold. His father bought the land intending to harvest the gold from the roots for an easy payday, and once he he died, Edward continued that mission. That much gold attracts attention though, so Edward Crow employed Marvin Trumbull to find a disused mine and launder the metal far away from the theme park. He found the perfect spot in an abandoned Brazilian mine, and using the gold he was able to build Crow Country to hide the extraction operation. But the trick didn't last. The Brazilian authorities caught on to what Marvin and Crow were doing down in Para, and at some point the guests began to appear in Georgia. Georgia too. Elaine was attacked, Crow Country was shut down, but the root harvesting didn't stop. The gold kept flowing until there was no way to hide where it was coming from, but with Marv's name on all the paperwork, it was him and him alone facing any consequences. That's why he's here in the park, looking for a way to save himself at any cost, or at least drag Edward Crow down with him. He's the closest thing Crow Country has to an active villain, but it doesn't last. He corners Mara and Tolman at the bottom of the park, deep underground where Crow harvested the roots, but he's almost immediately hurled into the void by Julie, who herself only ended up in the vents because of Marv's meddling. Tolman was in charge of root harvesting, but he's lost.
lost control of the theme park since Edward Crow returned and vanished. His records indicate he regrets everything that happened and his part in it, but like I said in the non-spoiler section, he doesn't really get enough screen time to act. As is, he seems content just keeping the guests from leaving the theme park, but Edward Crow actually wants to do something about it. You find Crow at the very bottom of the roots at a mysterious pool. There's no big final battle between Elaine and the man who caused her trauma. Not at first. Instead they have a heart to heart. And I like how despite everything Crow has done to Elaine, they understand and respect each other enough to have this conversation. He reveals that the guests appeared from the pool, and the more of the roots they harvested, the more degraded they became. The pool is a gate to somewhere or someone else and the roots are like tuning antenna that Crow has been systematically dismantling over the years, causing any who try to travel through it to emerge broken and mutated. The guests have never been trying to hurt anyone. They've been trying to communicate, to warn us of a cataclysm yet to come. But by the time the first of them began to arrive, Crow had already done irreparable damage to the roots. And even after learning the truth from the very first guest, the only one capable of speech, he kept harvesting the roots anyway. It took years for him to change his ways, but despite Crow's efforts to set things right, he's not redeemed and he doesn't want to be. The same infection afflicting the guests and everyone they come in contact with is on the cusp of killing him. He's managed to find a cure, but only made enough for the other survivors, however many there are. Rather than live with the guilt of having caused so much misery, he chooses to leap into the pool and see what's on the other side of the gate. What returns serves as the game's final boss, though there's still just enough of Edward Crow left to beg for death after he's defeated. Just don't try to use the shotgun after the fight is over. He's immune to the shotgun for some reason. Only use the handgun. Anyway, I love this fight. There's a fantastic spectacle to it, and it actually made the combat mechanics engaging, if only for for a few minutes. You actually have to learn Crow's attacks. You can't just stand in place and start blasting. He's way too tanky for that. I really like the detail of the pool turning red the more damage you do to him too. It's a good battle. Before he rocks backwards into the pool, another moment of goofiness that I'm really torn on, he gives Elaine a note containing a transcription of all the things that first guest said about the other side of the gate. You can refuse it if you want, and Elaine doesn't want to hear what Crow has to say once he returns from the other side. But if you take the note and open it up in the pause menu, you can learn the horrible truth about 2106. Like the truth of Mara's real identity, the numbers 2106 have been present in the game since its very beginning. And at first I thought it must be a code for a locked door somewhere in the park. But no, none of the keypads have a zero. So it stuck with me all through Crow Country. I kept waiting for it to finally come back in some way. And the payoff here was absolutely worth it. The true nature of the roots and the guests is tragic. It might use science fiction and horror elements to get its point across, but its commentary on humanity's preference for short-term gain over long-term prosperity hits the nail right on the head. The cosmic future will never be completed, never open to the public in 1990 like it was meant to. Edward Crow and his greed have seen to that. If the best horror media of a generation reflects the fears and concerns of the time, then in this current age of environmental uncertainty and unbridled corporate greed, Crow Country should stand as one of the crowning examples of the genre. Sometimes it really does feel like we're just guests stuck in the theme parks of uncaring billionaires, people who are unwilling to prevent catastrophe despite knowing it's coming. This is the good shit right here. What a thrill. It's just a shame that it's shackled to such an inconsistent tone. After putting Edward Crow out of his misery, Elaine and the other survivors leave the theme park behind and are cured of their infection. All throughout the game, Elaine has pondered the future whenever stopping to rest at a save point, and and that's also the note on which the game ends. Maybe the future will be alright after all. And maybe it won't. Only time will tell. 
Crow Country is by no means a bad game, but as a survival horror experience it left me a little disappointed. Once I relieved myself of my expectations, I found a lot to like about it. The puzzles and exploration are some of the most engaging I've played in a while, and there are certain plot elements that absolutely scratch that horror itch, but it's not perfect. I can ultimately overlook the camera controls and the combat mechanics. I understand why they are the way they are, even if it's not to my liking. And it's got a great sense of audiovisual style, but I cannot get past the tone. I'm always going to prefer survival horror games that revel in their idiosyncrasies like the classics from the 90s, or retro indie titles such as Alyssa or Signalis. The latter especially given it buffs out and streamlines a lot of the clunkiness inherent in the survival horror formula, like Crow Country does, but without sacrificing the sincerity of the writing or tone. I want to love Crow Country more than I do, but even if it isn't the game I wanted it to be, the game it actually is, is still really good. It might not be all that scary, but it's short, it's sweet, it's fun, and if you're a fan of the genre, it is absolutely worth the ride. And that's the video! If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. Share it around because YouTube sure won't. Let me know what you think down below, and maybe check out some of my other stuff. Anyway, I'll see you next time. Hopefully for a big one. Fingers crossed, I'll see you then. Thanks for watching.